Thank you, everyone, for coming to this talk. So the topic of my talk is going to be about prescriptive analytics. But before starting, I would like to make uh, some notes on the hype that has been created in the last years about big data. And you will see why I, have been, I need to talk about this. So probably most of you are uh, knowledgeable about this graph. This is Garner's hype cycle. And it tells you uh, how overexcited people are about certain technologies. And what I want you to point out is that we have big data over here. So in year, three years ago, big data was almost in the peak of inflated expectations. And what this means is that generally, there were more people talking about big data than people actually getting money from big data, more or less. OK, so next year, this didn't change much. Actually, big data was even more hyped. A year after that, suddenly, big data was dropping down. But this new cool concept appeared, data science. And you know how data science is now is the most sexy job on these kind of things. OK. And now this year, it seems like big data is nowhere to be found here. But now we have two new terms, which are machine learning and citizen data science. And if you ask me, I will say that machine learning is the mathematic way of doing data science. And citizen data science is like the uh, plot's way of doing it or something like that. But well, my point here is that I have taken the liberty to make this bar plot on the level of hypes in these previous years. And well, here I'm describing what has happened from three years ago up till now. And well, I have also, because I work with big data, make a prediction of what will happen in the following years. And of course, this prediction is probably not very good because, because I only have four data points. But it will seem that this tendency is going to go down. So what this means now is uh, if you are just selling big data projects based on all this hype, then you better do it now and don't wait anymore. OK? So everybody, just sell big data. Go like crazy. Uh, I'm joking, of course, right? So I, I know that in, at this conference, we are a little bit more serious. and We are taking this uh, more professionally. But what I'm trying to say here is, OK, what's better to know? What's happening now? What will happen in the future? Or how can you take advantage of that? OK. Now, why do I ask these questions? Because essentially, this is what you can do with your data. You can do three kinds of analysis which answer these questions. And these are descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics, and these are incremental. So let me go a little bit more into the detail of these three. Descriptive analytics, I'm sure all of you already know about it. Essentially, it's about taking a lot of data, humongous amount of data, petabytes maybe, and summarizing all of this in some figure or some number that can tell something meaningful for, something meaningful for us. And you can do this by key performance indicators, by using dashboards, by using visualizations, so for instance, this is a visualization we performed last year when we had this Ebola crisis in Madrid. You maybe heard about it in the news. So this is the Spanish conversation about this topic. And we, have, uh, we are plotting here the different communities of conversation in different colors. So you can find here uh, the government groups, the critical groups, which is quite big, I have to say, uh, the opposing groups, and so on. And this is a good example of descriptive analytics, because we have taken a couple of million tweets and summarized them in a simple graph that allows us to understand what's going on there with all this data. Okay. Now, if you ask me, say you have to take some business decision based on this previous graph, where is the intelligence in that process? So certainly, you have taken a lot of time and used a lot of technologies and maybe infrastructure to produce that plot and to understand what's going on there. But I will say that, actually, the intelligence part is on this guy here that's looking at the data and taking a decision. So how can you make the life of, of this guy a little bit more easy? Well, you can go to the next step, which is predictive analytics. And essentially, what prediction is about is about estimating data that you don't have. You can invoke there a number of techniques for machine learning, like regression, classification, clustering, 
density estimation, anomaly detection, and so on. With this, you can do things like predicting how the sales of your product will evolve during the next weeks, let's say. And this is useful because now the decision taker has two different sources of information. You can actually look at the descriptive data of your business, and you can actually look at this estimated data that can help you get a better idea of what's going on. But still, the intelligent part in this system is this guy here. And it's like that in most companies. So Garner made a study of this, and it seems like 84% uh, of companies using big data are just using uh, descriptive analytics. Only 3% have taken the step to the top level of analytics, which is prescriptive. And the general idea of prescriptive analytics is about the data telling you what you need to do to improve your business. And I'd like to explain it in the following way. So let's imagine this tree is your business and the possible futures of it. Today, you are at this starting point, and every day you need to take a decision which produces this branching. This could be a decision like, should I keep the price of my product fixed, or should I produce a rise in this price and see what happens? So when you take this decision, you are branching toward different ways, and then the next day you need to take a different decision, and the next day another one, and so on. You have a lot of possible branchings that have an impact in your business. So where do you want to go? I think it's pretty obvious, right? You would like to go there. But of course, the pro real problem is that you don't know where that there is. So where do you need to go with actions you need to take to maximize your benefit? You might have some intuitions, but you can actually do better if you use data. So the general idea is if you use descriptive analytics, you can have some idea of how your business is working up to now. Then with predictive analytics and based on this past history, you can predict the possible outcomes of all these choices and then combine all this information and get the best possible outcome. Okay. This was all very uh, theoretical, but let me give you some insights about how this works. So essentially, to perform prescriptive analytics, you need three ingredients. Two of them I already talked about. They are the previous levels of analytics, descriptive and predictive. And the third one is to invoke techniques from the field of numerical optimization. So this is something different from the usual machine learning stuff. Let's start with a very simple example. Let's say you have three possible choices that you can take today in your business, A, B, and C. And what you will do is by using uh, descriptive and predictive analytics, estimate the expected outcome of each one of these actions. And now let's say you have a limited budget, so you can only choose two of them. Well, of course, what you will do is take the two ones that have the largest expected benefit, right? B and C. Well, of course, life is not that simple. And usually what happens is that in your business, you have a lot of different levers or a lot of parameters or actions you can take. And these are not independent. They are usually correlated. They have interrelated costs, dependencies, so on. So what you need to do is to take a numerical optimization approach. So you will start with some configuration of your business parameters, estimate with predictive analytics uh, what's the expected outcome of that, and then try to go for a better configuration. How do you do that? If your problem is well-behaved, you can invoke uh, ideas from operations research, like linear, quadratic programming, and so on. If it's not so simple to write it down mathematically, you will have to use more complex models, like genetic algorithms, or even more fancy things, like ant colony optimizations. Okay. That's the general idea. And very briefly, I will give you three examples of projects we are working in, in which we are trying to use these ideas. The first one is customer service automation. So we worked together with this company in which uh, the customer service was uh, structured in two levels. In the first level, uh, you will call this call center or wrote an email, and some op human operator will read your complaint, classify it into some topic, and then redirect it to the appropriate expert. And this task can be hard, because for this particular company, they have 300 different topics about complaints. So it's really a hard classification task. Uh, you can improve this by introducing a machine learning system that actually reads this text, automatically assigns a level, and sends it to the appropriate expert. Now, where is the prescriptive key here? Because so far, it seems like a traditional classification model. The key is that 
the system here is able to assess its own confidence in its classifications. So it can tell you, I'm very confident this complaint is about topic A, so I will send it directly to this guy. But it can also say, I'm not really sure about the topic of this email. So I recommend you that a human expert should read it, tell me back what's the correct level, and then I will use it to improve my model in an active learning fashion. So here the prescriptive part is very limited, but it still has some value. If we, if we actually, well, we, we run this uh, in a benchmark for this company, and the output results are shown in this plot, you can actually save about 55% of the classification time of the human readers if you use a system of this kind. Now, the second example I would like to talk about is smart pricing, and it, this is about automatically deciding what's the best price for a product. We are starting to study this idea with a hotel company in Spain, and the techniques we are going to use are basically what I have described. First, we plan to build a model that can predict uh, the customer demands at different hotels. Then we can simulate how this demand is going to change if the pricing strategy gets modified, and then we'll try to optimize for the best strategy. So when you are trying to build a product like this, uh, a pricer, you need to either create perfect predictions, which is generally not realistic, or you need to be able to tell what's the risk associated with your predictions so that the company you're working with can build a strategy that is uh, aligned with their risk aversion. Now, you can introduce all kinds of parameters, not only from the clients to estimate their demands, but also from the product, in this case, the hotel features, the marketing actions you are performing on these clients, and also environmental conditions like weather, the placement of your business, and so on. Still, you can find things like this. So this is an example I found in some blog in which you can find that you could buy this very interesting book about genetics of the flies for the budget price of $2 million. Actually, if you buy this in this shop, you have a very nice discount. And well, what happened here? I don't know what kind of pricing algorithm these guys were using, but it seems like it's lacking common sense, right? And that's another key aspect. You need to interact with an expert in the subject matter to actually give you these common sense rules so you can introduce them into the system. And you can use this in the form of uh, linear programming constraints or there are different techniques to actually collaborate with the domain expert and the guy doing the optimization process. If you do all of this, you can actually build something that is successful. And my last example is going to be about retail logistics optimization. And this is something we have been working this now for two years already with one of uh, the major international banks located uh, with headquarters here in Madrid. And well, this is the next, pro next project that we are, we are trying to achieve is to optimize the amount of cash that the bank must deposit at each one of its ATMs along the country every day. So what do we do? Essentially, we follow the same steps I talked about previously. We predict what the customer demands will be in the following weeks, and then we generate an optimization policy that tells you when you need to order this transportation for the moving cash between br bank branches. So we have taken into account a lot of different factors, like not only the expected behavior of customers, but all, also the expected behaviors of shops that are going to deposit money at the end of the day at the local branches, the level of risk that the bank is uh, uh, able to accept, and the different costs in the system, transportation rates, Euribor rates, regulations from the government, regulations about the uh, transportation companies, so on. What we expect is that if we can apply this globally, we will get about 14% reduction in the cost of this system. Okay? So my take-home message for today is that you can actually go one extra mile when doing analytics. So most people just uh, start with descriptive analytics, and I'm not saying that bad. That adds a lot of value if you have nothing before. But you can actually go through prediction and even to prescription so that your data tells you what the better actions, the best actions you can do with your business model. So to summary 
all of this in just a single question. Don't ask yourself what you can do for your data. What you need to ask is what your data are going to do for you. Okay, thank you.